The secret goddess revealed, not history, but her story. Did you take a nap? Yeah, you did take a nap. <laughs> You know, this feminine loving energy from the mother, I've, I've been looking for the scientific research behind this. Why is it so nurturing and, and uh, effective? And, uh, what is it uh, neurologically that causes this? When I found Victoria, it, it really was a missing piece to specifically, scientifically, how this works. Victoria Cooper is a developmental neurobiologist and she's here to explain to us how the brain develops and she understands why certain people are vulnerable to both psychopathology which includes addiction as well as abuse. My niche is working with addicts and the special thing about what I do in my profession is that I have the privilege of studying with one of the foremost neurobiologists in the world. So therefore, I've become kind of a specialist in the neurobiology of addiction. The reason that that is so important is that what I'm able to do with my clients is to teach them about why they're using, why they're using, why are they doing irrational things that they know are bad for themselves and bad for their life and they don't understand it and it creates a lot of shame and it ruins their families. The mission of Edmunds Foundation is to stop the abuse of women and children, the goddess, the one who nurtures, whereas my mission is to help addicts stop abusing themselves and their families. The question is, how do you do this? How do you go about this? And what we both teach is that there is nothing wrong with individuals inherently. We're all born as good people, but something has gone awry. And I facilitate groups of addicts, and one of the first questions that I ask them usually is, why did you start using? And they'll say, well, I'm bored or whatever. But the other thing they say that's very profound that's, and telling is that they say, I felt normal for the first time in my life. So that, that raises the whole question of why didn't they feel normal before this? And this is the crux of the whole problem, that addiction is really, as Dr. Vincent Felitti says, is a, is a solution to a problem. People are just trying to put themselves out of pain and agony. Well, where does this pain come from? Why do people feel bad? They feel bad, they don't know how to cope with uncomfortable feelings, they're exposed to the drug culture which is rampant from the time they're in elementary school, sadly enough. So they do a drug, let's say marijuana, and they feel good and it blunts their pain and that's the way they learn to cope. The whole question is why do they feel bad and this is where I come in and this is where I have been so privileged to have the opportunity to study with Dr. Alan Shore, who's one of the foremost developmental neurobiologists in the world. And he's explained to me, as well as the other group members, how the brain develops and how the development of the brain can go awry. The thing that's so shocking that most people probably don't know is that when the human baby is born, only 25% of its brain is developed. The remaining 75% of the brain hasn't been developed and it is experience dependent, which means that the health of the growing brain depends upon the kinds of experiences that this baby from the time it's born has with its primary caretaker, which is usually the mother. So if those experiences are not optimum, it doesn't mean that the baby's being abused. I want to make that clear. This can be a loving mother that simply doesn't have the proper information. 
If the mother doesn't have the proper information, she's not going to be able to pay attention to the cues that the baby needs to have the remainder of its brain grow into a healthy adult. The emotional underpinnings of the human being reside in the right hemisphere of the brain. It's called the limbic system, and they're deep within the brain. And again, they are experience dependent. They are not on board when the baby is born. Their growth and development and their health or lack thereof is completely dependent upon the interaction that these structures and that this baby has with its environment and with the people in its environment. If the mother has been abused, she's not going to know how to raise a healthy baby. She's going to probably try to perpetuate this, the, the style in which she was raised. So then we have this tra transgenerational abuse system going on. So what Edmund and I want to do is we want to educate and enlighten parents how to raise healthy kids. These very conscientious and highly educated parents are given these lists, these to-do lists, like they have to buy all this equipment or else their babies aren't going to be healthy, and they feel tremendous pressure to do so. In addition, they're reading books, such as a book written, I don't know the exact title, but like how to get a child, a baby to sleep through the night and what is, uh, what, what is conveyed in this book is let your child cry it out and eventually the child will sleep through the night. That's true, the child will sleep through the night, but what's happening to an infant of two, three, four months when it's sleeping through the night and its cries are not responded to is that this little infant is going to, into a dissociated state and it has this unconscious etching of a memory that when it has a need, nobody's going to be there to respond to that need. And this memory, it's unconscious, it's in the right hemisphere of the brain, but it drives the whole trajectory of this little baby's life through adulthood. So Edmund and I just want to simplify things for parents and make it easier and put the joy back in so that parents can enjoy their children and not have this crazy laundry list of things that they have to do and just to get back to basics. Basics being just gazing, looking your child in the eye, responding to your baby when the baby gives you cues. And when a parent does these sorts of things, what happens is what it's called secure attachment. So the baby grows up expecting that its needs are going to be met. Now, all mothers, they're not, I mean, mothers love their babies, but they don't necessarily know how to raise the healthy baby. There could be, for example, a professional mother who loves her baby, but she's preoccupied. So she's not really paying attention to the subtle cues that the baby's giving her. The baby might be crying, so she could pick the baby up, but she's not gazing at the baby. She's not holding, cradling the baby correctly. She's talking on the phone. She's preoccupied. And this creates another situation, which is another unconscious expectation of a baby who grows up with what is called an insecure anxious attachment or insecure avoidant attachment. It's a baby that doesn't feel that the person's going to be there to take care of their needs. So the insecure avoidant baby grows up sort of auto-regulating, not depending on another person. This is the kind of person that is just isolates and is afraid of intimacy because their needs weren't met. And this is all unconscious stuff. It's, it's such fascinating information because it's really about brain development. And if, if you're lucky enough to have a secure, healthy attachment, then you're not going to be vulnerable to being an abuser or being abused, and you're not going to be vulnerable to addiction. So these are some of the areas that Edmund and I both touch on from different angles and vantage points. 
The surprising thing to me is that I am one of the few people in the field of therapy or addiction that talks about and knows about the neurobiology of addiction. I recently taught a course to postdoctoral students who had never even heard one thing about the neurobiology of addiction. And they just couldn't get enough because the truth is is that when, once you know about how the brain works and wh why it goes awry, then you can help to correct it and help people to restore their dignity and rebuild their family. And Again, we want to simplify and bring joy to the process of child rearing and of life in general. And one of the basic ways to do this, let's say as a new parent, is kind of this nonverbal interaction that the mother has with her baby. It's nonverbal, and it's sort of a right brain to right brain interaction whereby the mother notices the cues of the baby and responds appropriately so that the baby knows and understands that its needs are going to be met. So all it takes is just not being diverted by all this media stuff that's just bombards all of us and confuses all of us. It's just hold your baby. I mean, we could go to the fields of Africa and probably these women could teach us something. It's about holding your baby, nurturing your baby, cradling your baby. It's about the gaze, eye-to-eye -eye contact. It's about touch. It's about recognizing the different tones of the cry of the baby. Because one cry might mean the baby's wet, and another cry might mean it just needs to be held. Don't do this and let your baby cry. Unfortunately, that's just not accurate, and beyond being not accurate, it's damaging and it's really the etiology of a lot of psychopathology including addiction and it doesn't have to be that way so people need to be educated and they need to learn that they don't have to have these long lists and they just need to relax and be themselves and enjoy their baby and then we're not going to have this situation of abusers and abused women and abused children. It just it doesn't have to be. We can break the cycle, but it takes education. It takes people being exposed to this, this, all this very, very cutting-edge material. So what is a conscientious parent supposed to do? They look around. Maybe they'll go to Barnes & Noble. And they'll find something like this publication, which is Scientific American, a very credible publication, talking about the mind and how to raise a happy child. Well, if you read this, you will find that they don't even touch any of the issues that I'm talking about. They don't get near it. They continue to perpetuate myths about what you need to do to raise a healthy child. And it's, it's misleading, it's confusing, and it causes stress. Now then there's this book, which is called The Impact of Early Life Trauma on Health and Disease. And this is a book that the, the layman will have no access to. However, this book describes what goes on with healthy connections and what goes on with connections that are not as attuned. And it explains to parents the subtleties of what they need to do to raise what the Scientific American article says is a resilient child. But they explain it in a very scientific, concrete way that is just not accessible to the public. So this is the sort of thing that I, I, I believe it's everybody's birthright to be happy and have peace of mind. And they don't have access to the material. But Edmund and I do have access to the material. And this is what we want to spread around. Because everybody deserves to enjoy their life and to raise kids that grow up happy and well-balanced. And this is, this is our mission.